Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to the ladies' room. What better topic for us to discuss in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica? Today, we're talking about how clean toilets are not a given around the world, and neither is clean water. We're also going to talk about why you should be interested and concerned about this. Millions of people, mostly female, get infections from lack of clean water, resulting from poor hygiene, menstrual hygiene issues, and even rape during these horrific conditions. So here's some facts. Worldwide, 844 million people don't have clean water. And this includes Americans in places like Flint, Michigan, and Puerto Rico, but also many others. One in three people on the planet don't have a decent toilet. One in nine don't have clean water close to home. Worldwide, up to 443 million school days are lost every year due to water-related illnesses. And every minute, a newborn dies from infection caused by lack of safe water and an unclean environment. So in the time we're talking, more than 30 babies will die from these infections. I'm gonna be talking with the head of WaterAid, a nonprofit with the goal of bringing clean water, sanitation, and hygiene to over 37 countries across the globe. From 2016 to 2017, WaterAid reached one and a half million people with clean water, 2.3 million with decent toilets, and 3.2 million with good hygiene. Think about that. Think about how upset you get when you can't find a proper clean public restroom in a mall. And now think about 2.3 million people being provided with decent toilets. Since 1981, WaterAid has reached 26.4 million people with clean water and 26.3 million with decent toilets. Now this is not just a problem in other countries that our president has disparaged. Right here in the United States, due to a misguided and cost-cutting change in water source, the percentage of Flint children with elevated blood level, uh, lead levels doubled from about 2.5% in 2013 to about 5% in 2015, in just two years. That water change was also a possible source of an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease that has killed 10 people and affected another, or infected another 77. Due to insufficient water treatment, over 100,000 residents in Flint, Michigan were potentially exposed to high levels of lead in their drinking water. A federal state of emergency was declared in January 2016, and Flint residents were instructed to use only bottled, bottled or filtered water for drinking, cooking, cleaning, and bathing. As of early 2017, the water quality had returned to quote unquote acceptable levels, but residents were still instructed to continue using bottled or filtered water until all the lead pipes had been replaced, which is not expected to be completed before 2020. In other news, recently more than one and a half million Americans in Puerto Rico were left without safe uh, drinking water in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Two months after Maria hit the island, Puerto Ricans were still saying that odorous, discolored, and ill-tasting water was coming out of their taps. But a report from the National Natural Resources Defense Council, which came out before Hurricane Maria, showed that in 2015, 99.5% of Puerto Ricans had water sources which had violated the Safe Drinking Water Act. These violations included contamination, failure to properly treat the water, and failure to conduct water testing or to report it as is required by federal rules. A substantial majority, 69.4% of the population, was using tap water with unlawfully high levels of contaminants, such as coliform bacteria, disinfection byproducts, and volatile organic compounds, or water that had just not been treated in accordance with federal standards. In other news, California has experienced numerous droughts, including from 2012 to 2016. But the Colorado River Basin, which provides critical water supplies for seven states, including California, has been compromised for more than 16 years. We're talking about Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and California, who all share water from the Colorado River. This is an importantly, hugely important water source. 
uh, that sustains 45 million people, supports 15% of the nation's food supply, and fills two of the largest water reserves in the country. I could go on and on, but I have to end with my own state of New Jersey, where the water supply has been found to be wildly contaminated with lead and other suspected carcinogens. One study tested drinking fountain water in 323 New Jersey schools in 49 districts across 12 counties. Of these, 137 schools found at least one point of discharge that exceeded the action level for lead, which causes brain damage in children. Levels in Newark and Camden were the highest. So now to switch gears and tell you about my guest who is much more well-informed about all of these issues than I am. Serena Probasi joined WaterAid as its CEO in 2014. She has over 20 years experience in international development, previously serving as Deputy Chief of Programs at Orbis International, as Country Representative at WaterAid Ethiopia, and she has a decade of service at PACT Incorporated, both in Washington, DC and overseas. As a tribute to her vision and leadership, Serena was named by both Fortune and Food and Wine magazines as one of the most innovative women in food and drink and honored by New York Business Journal as a 2016 Woman of Influence. Originally from Nepal, Serena is now based in New York City, where she's a proud mother to two young girls and a co-founder of, I don't even know how to say this, Bouni Coffee? Is that right, Serena? Bouni Coffee, uh uh-huh. Okay, I want to hear more about that. A fair trade organic coffee company. She holds a BA in economics from Smith College and a Master's of Science and Development Studies from the University of London. Serena, welcome to the ladies' room. Thank you. So glad to be here. Ah, it, it is such a pleasure because, of course, obviously, the ladies' room is our topic because we like to talk about things the way we would talk about them in the ladies' room. But what could be more important and more relevant to a ladies' room themed show? Then talking about women around the world who don't have access to proper hygiene, proper clean water, proper menstruation products, et cetera. So tell me about your organization, tell me about your work, and tell me about your passion. So I, I found uh, WaterAid when I was living in Ethiopia, mm-hmm. and uh, when I first applied for my job uh, at WaterAid, I thought, hmm, it's a single issue organization. I wonder if this is going to be boring. Um, and it has not in the slightest because water, um, you know, as I found, and I think it's sort of when you think about it, it makes sense. Water runs through everything. Mm-hmm. It, it, it affects almost any issue that one could be passionate about. And the majority um, of our bodies are composed of water. Yes, ourselves, our surroundings, our planet, um, and, you know, when you think about women's issues and women's rights and what, what's holding women back in many countries is the fact that they have to spend hours and hours worrying about where their water supply is going to come from or that, you know, their families are sick from water and sanitation related diseases, preventable things, um, or, you know, uh, people who could maybe have jobs and do other things. Um, there's just such a barrier to so many things. So I found that it actually connected almost everything that I cared about. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I've stayed with water, sanitation, hygiene pretty much since. Um, And the organization, WaterAid, that's that's the main focus. It's it's water, sanitation. And and when we talk about sanitation, it's really about toilets, Mm -hmm. uh, ladies' rooms. Um, and all things hygiene, that we care something about. Something as simple passion. as hand washing with soap, which is the cheapest way um, to actually save lives. Um, and that so many people are actually suffering from lots of diseases that are preventable by hand washing with soap. So it's one of the most cost effective, simple things that can be done. And we put these three things together because together they have the best health outcomes. If you just had clean water, that's great. But if, you know, there's contamination and um, if the environment isn't clean and there are no bathrooms for people to use, the clean water only takes you so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you had both of those things and yet there was no uh, soap or disinfecting or anything like that, then that would also um, sort of not take you very far. So the three things, we put them together. Um, And the mission of the organization is really to to, to, to reach everyone everywhere um, and that everyone in the world should have these basic things that many of us take for granted. Yeah, I think that's the, the bottom line is that many of us who are listening really do take this for granted. Even I'm thinking of you hearing about hand washing with soap. 
and how critically important that is. And it's, that's a very timely message right now for us in the United States, because especially on the East Coast, we're facing a flu epidemic right now. And the number yeah. one thing you can yeah. do to prevent the flu in general in most years is get the flu vaccine. But yeah. this particular year, the vaccine was not particularly effective. Mm -hmm. So the number two thing that you can do to prevent the flu is just frequent hand washing. Yeah. And it seems so basic and it's such a basic message, but we're still trying to drum it into people. So you can't do basic hand washing if you don't have water and you don't have soap. Although I guess the people at Purell would argue that point. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, you know, one of the things we like to ask all of our guests is what is the most unique, interesting, or memorable experience you've ever had in a ladies room? Um, that's a really good question. And as I'm thinking about it, um, it's for me, actually, with all my travels and how much we focus on, you know, toilets and different kinds of places and bathrooms, I sort of have a, a flash of all the, these unique and quite different uh, bathrooms that I've been in, <laughs> you know, either made of bamboo or on slats or holes in the ground or maybe surrounded by a shower curtain mm -hmm. or just the way that people innovate and adapt um, the actual, what you would consider a, a ladies room mm -hmm. um, and how that can look in different places. We use the term very euphemistically and sometimes very broadly. Yes. <laughs> so tell me, if you can't pick the number one, tell me some of your experiences that have surprised you, shocked you, remained with you. Yeah, I think, I think you know, the, the thing that continues to shock me is um, just the impact that this not having a place to go right, to use another euphemism, mm -hmm. not having a place to go, what that does to a person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm thinking of young girls who are so scared to go outside at night. And, you know, there's stories about snakes in the grass or, you know, girls being attacked or other horrible things that can happen in the dark. And as a young child having to go outside um, to use the bathroom, you know, because you know, a lot of times, especially kids, young adults, all of us, you know, we wake up in the middle of the night and we might have to go to the bathroom. Um, or first thing in the morning when you wake up, it's like, you know, it is such a worry and such a stressor uh -huh. for so many people and also a source of so much, um, you know, in some cases, shame and in some cases, just all these horrible feelings, both psychological and also very practical. Mm -hmm. um, and then for women and girls, like, you know, if you add to that, um, the is issue of menstruation, which, you know, so many uh, schools that I visited where, um, you know, talk to young adolescent girls and, you know, their attendance record isn't so great. And you start talking to them about why they're not coming to school. And it's because they have their period and there's no way to manage that in the school. There's no bathroom. There's no privacy. There's, there may not have um, the right products or materials to, in order to manage. So, you know, what they're using for pads or, and those things like, who do they talk about uh, that with? You don't really talk about that with your principal or your teachers, um, especially if they're male. Mm -hmm. And it's that, uh, it's such a awkwardness and also again, shame related to that. Um, so I think some of my most striking experiences are around just, the hardship that um, people go through for something so basic mm -hmm. and something that is just, you know, it's not something you can control. It's a basic biological function, uh, you know, both having to use the toilet, but also um, menstruation for women. So it's, it's just um, for some people it becomes this trap. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also, you know, I think about other stories. Um, I remember talking to a doctor in a health facility once, and he said, well, actually, before I see that patient, I have to go home to wash my hands because there's no water here. And you just think, well, how does somebody do their job in that environment? Um, so that actually might be images another, that are the most striking. That might be another thing that your organization can help with uh, medical professionals. Um, there are uh, canisters that can be mounted on the wall that's just a special foam cleanser. 
that yeah. you can wash your hands without needing water and then it evaporates. Or certainly I, I'm calling out to the Purell people to you know, get involved uh, here as well. Uh, but have you ever been in a situation where you're in a country or you know, in a location where you could not find a restaurant? Yes, for yourself. Oh, very often. I'll be, we'll be in a car, we'll be driving, you know, the next place we have to go visit is seven hours away. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of accepted that, you know, the men will sort of go behind the bush and there are no other alternatives. So, you know, that's, that's what you have to do <laughs> if you have to go or, you know, you don't drink as much water as you should. You're really careful about what you eat and drink and and that's you know those are like small moments for us but for people that you know live in those circumstances that's sort of a daily reality and whereas for us it's something a, a maybe a huge inconvenience when we're traveling or when we're somewhere um but no it's a it, because it's such a, a daily normal biological thing you know when you're when we're going to sometimes quite remote areas um working with communities villages then you use the facilities they use. And if there are no facilities, you do, you know, you have to do what they do. You have, um, you have to answer nature's call in nature. Yeah, and there's only so long that you can sort of hold that off, you know, after a while, it just, it is, it's sort of undeniable, so. I'll tell you uh, a horrible story. I once went camping, and actually this was the last time I went camping. My version of camping now is sleeping in a hotel with the windows open. But um, <laughs> the last time I went camping, camping, I tried not to move my bowels as long as I could. I think I lasted three or four days, and then I just had to go, and I squatted in the woods. And guess where I got poison ivy? Oh no. That was horrible. Oh that no. Was, that was really kind of awful. But if you think about it, um, you know, even women here, uh, if we know that we're not going to be someplace where we're going to have easy access to a toilet, we do restrict our fluids. Yes. And we often get uh, dehydrated as a result. I think that was actually the problem with Hillary Clinton when she was at the 9 11 ceremony and had that very famous episode mm -hmm. where she nearly fainted. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, she was standing all those hours. She was probably wearing a bulletproof vest and Spanx, uh, which is the most uncomfortable <laughs> garment ever. Uh, and I'm talking about the Spanx, not the bulletproof. <laughs> and she was sick. And she probably didn't drink anything because she knew she wasn't going to be able to get to a restroom. And I think that was clearly apparent to every woman who saw that situation and every man was like oh what was wrong with her that you know she couldn't stand and it was a very very hot day and many of the countries that you're working in are very very warm yep yep very very warm climates yeah no it's 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 something that you know the more you think about the more you think wow how much time and energy and worry get spent on this and you know you mentioned camping and I think that's a really good example because for many of us that is the only kind of first-hand experience mm -hmm. that people have with being in a setting where you know you don't have access to your normal bathroom or your shower or your you know where you normally wash your hands and you have to and so I think camping is actually a really good um, and frame to think about um, how you feel when you're camping and how it's not ideal. Uh, well, I, think, I think everybody has a way that they could potentially relate to this topic. So for example, yeah. here in New Jersey, when we had Superstorm Sandy, most of us lost our electricity yes. and our water supply. And yeah. people forget how intricately connected yes. electricity and water supply are. Yes. Um, but in my town, we uh, didn't have public water. We had uh, septic tanks. And so we weren't even able to flush the toilets. Yeah. And so we had to go somewhere else yeah. to try. And we couldn't get out of our neighborhood for the first couple of days. Yeah. Um, so that was our connection. And that was only two weeks. You know, yeah. I think about these poor people in Puerto Rico who have gone months without clean water and without facilities and with drinking water that's contaminated. But this is also an issue for people who have, uh, in the United States, who have bladder problems. Yeah. So people who have overactive bladder. Uh, I've heard stories of women who've told me that they carry 
a female urinal in the car so that in case they're somewhere that they don't have quick access to a toilet, they yeah. just literally pee in the car uh, using a female urinal, which has got to be very gymnastics uh, heavy uh, <laughs> to be able to properly do that. Um, and then they also do something called toilet mapping, where they don't go out unless they know where yes. the restrooms are going to be. And then, of course, we've all had the experience where we've been in a train station uh, and we've had to use a bathroom that was really not properly maintained. Yes. I have to give a shout out to Canada, who has the nicest, most clean public restrooms I have any, ever seen anywhere. Um, but I've been in public restrooms in other countries like Turkey, where I was really surprised, even in Istanbul, there were some places I went where it was literally just a room with a hole. Yeah. The and the first time I saw that, I was a little taken aback, I admit. And then I got used to it. Yeah. 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 That, that was just temporary. That wasn't my everyday experience. So tell us some of the stories that you've heard from young women who for this is for whom this is their everyday experience or the before and after stories you know, yeah talked about how many I, mean, I think that's one of the really died. fun things about working in this area is that um the impact is so um tangible mm -hmm. you know you can see it you can see the change um and it's really rewarding when you can see that um and so you know it, it's it's I'm thinking about a woman who I was talking to um, on a visit in Ethiopia who was, you know, growing her own vegetables. And the water for the vegetables was kind of the wastewater that came out of the hand washing and all of that gray water, right? So it was not um, contaminated. It was just was water that had been used to wash hands or, in the sh or take a bath or shower. Um, and she was able to start this business and, you know, really provide much more for her family and for herself and and the pride of sort of being becoming a small business owner and entrepreneur um, and that so there are stories that are that are really about that that are about economic uh, impact and economic empowerment for people and other other you know other things that um, women do are sometimes um, start small food businesses where they make something then uh, with having like um, you know, it might be tamales, or it might be uh, roasted corn, or it may be whatever it is in that particular country. And so a lot of times, like, uh, quick businesses that are, don't require a lot of capital investment, but they can get started, and it can give them the experience, and then the confidence, and then to, um, to take those first steps. Um, and so th that's an example. I think the kids in school are just, you know, kids everywhere are pretty hilarious. So um, the, the kids in school who, you know, talk about how all the lengths they used to have to go to to use the bathroom or all the excuses they would use mm -hmm. um, and sort of now having, you know, easier access to water, both water and uh, toilets and sort of, um, I think that that's, that's always wonderful to see. But you know, when I visit a place, often when we go somewhere, um, especially when I worked much more directly with our programs, um, you could, it was visible. You could go to a place um, if we were doing our initial assessments with our local partners and we hadn't actually done anything there yet. And if you visited a place where, you know, the water and sanitation um, work had been done for a couple of years, the difference is really palpable. Everything, the children are healthier, mm -hmm. the animals are healthier, the, you know, it's cleaner. Um, it, there's just a different um, vibrancy to a place where people don't have to waste endless hours just thinking about the basics. Yeah, just um, walking and, to, I saw, I saw the movie uh, Queen of Katwa. Did you see yes. that? I loved that movie. Um, and it just really hit me. They have this several poignant scenes yes. where she has to walk, I don't know, a mile or more each yeah. way just to get a bucket full of water that she carries on her head like the girl in the yeah. picture behind you. Yeah. And, and then when you have to do that, then you think about how you ration that water, right? Mm -hmm. Because you've, you've had to walk for miles with this thing on your head. Um, you're not going to waste that water and you may not even want to use it for everything that you know you should because it's a scarce resource. So you're gonna 
ration it out and really prioritize how that gets used. And um, I thought that movie actually did a really good job of also talking about hygiene. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, when she enters a room where people sort of make fun of her because she's smelly or she's a bit dirty, her clothes are dirty. And um, I think, you know, for everybody, but there's a particular connotation, I think, for women and girls um, when they cannot keep themselves clean um, and feel clean about, you know, where if the clothes are dirty or, if, you know. Or stained, or if they have blood stains. That blood they, stains, they or if people are like, oh, you know, that smell. Mm -hmm. um, and we have that here in New York City. We have that on the subway with homeless people who, you know, water and sanitation are one of their biggest problems. Like, right. where do they go to the bathroom? And look for a job if you can't take a shower, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so there's, there's, I think it's, it, for me, I, when I see it in New York, it, I, I always think about that too. Um, well, I was just talking to, we had uh, Dorothy the organizer on uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you know, she's on the hit television show, The Hoarders, and she's uh -huh. the organizer. And when I asked her about her most interesting experience in a restroom, uh, this was an interesting story. She talked about with hoarders, you know, and these are people who fill every space in their house. I had never thought of this. They also fill every space in their bathrooms. So they can't uh, use their toilet because just they have so much stuff oh my on top of it. So she once asked them, you know, where do you relieve yourself if, you know, in this mess? And some of them just use a Home Depot bucket out in the backyard. Some go to a local Starbucks or the library or oh my a goodness. restaurant. Uh, and some just, you know, go in the, in the backyard. And it's, that's how pervasive. Now, that's obviously a very different situation than you're dealing with because these are people who are making this decision because they have a mental illness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and even though they have access to proper restrooms, they actually don't have access to their own bathrooms in their own homes. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm um, just pointing out these examples because I want everybody who's listening to think about, you know, how we are so privileged in this country uh, to have access for the most part, not everywhere, as I said in the introduction, but for the most part, most of us have access to uh, proper toileting facilities and clean water, which is just such a basic, basic need. But I want people to think about even all the subpopulations in our own country where, who don't have this um, and the times in our lives when we've been kept from this, even for a matter of hours or days. And you know, we feel like something you know, major has been taken away from us. Yeah. So, so tell me about some of the programs that WaterAid is doing in different countries. So our work is in, um, in Asia and Africa and Latin America. Uh, WaterAid has been around for a long time. We're the, we're the largest global organization that focuses on water sanitation and hygiene. Um, and our programs are, they're really specific. So in each place we look at um, what's already happening? What are people already doing? Where are the gaps? And where can we play a role? Um, we always partner with local organizations because we feel they know best mm -hmm. and they really understand um, their own context. And then we are there to support how, how we can. Uh, sometimes that means technical support, financial support. Um, so I would say that there is no sort of blueprint for a water aid program. And that's something I'm really proud of because it means that uh, we've really looked at each situation. Of course, there are things that are in common. There are themes, but you know, it's not that we promote a certain, like we only do wells or we only do this or that. So it really depends. And, and some of this is based on the geology of a place, where the water is, what the water source is, what's most cost effective, mm -hmm. um, and how can this be sustained so that it's not something that becomes our role. Our role is not to provide water um, and sanitation to people for in the long term. Um, and what we're trying to do is sort of kind of show the way mm -hmm. um, and, and help people and communities or local governments in figuring that out and then creating a system that will continue um, for a long time, you know, so that it, it will continue. Um, it's financially viable. 
um, that technically people have the skills how to how to how to maintain and and uh, do the upkeep. Um, so a lot of it is about training. It's about um, skills. It's about creating opportunities for people out of these gaps. Um, and we work. You know, I'm always I'm always just stunned by the strength and resilience and the effort that people put into this because it's a huge priority for communities. They really want this. So, you know, we've had communities where the water source was a spring and there was no way to access it, you know, and they would literally get together and, you know, build a road, you know, a gravel road or a dirt road, but some way for us to access that place or, you know, a lot of labor, it's a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears and that goes into it. And uh, that's a really important part of the, the process for us. So and are the people in that local ownership. And so you're partnering with local organizations or you're bringing in teams of your people who are then training uh, local We people. have teams in many countries and um, often uh, those teams are national teams. Mm -hmm. So there are people with skills and experience in countries. Um, sometimes we also have international teams um, but we always partner with local organizations as much as possible, really, because that's, that's how it's going to continue in the future. We're really um, cognizant of this, you know, making sure that what we start can be continued. Mm -hmm. that's um, awesome. And that's something that's really important to us. And it's been part of our approach from the beginning. Well, it's that whole thing about giving a man a fish or teaching him how to fish. Exactly. Um, so what is the budget of your organization? Um, that's a really good question. So it changes year on year because um, of, you know, large grants, they come, they go. We're um, around 13 million here in the US. Um, we're a global federation. So there are water aids in other countries. And, um, you know, so I run water aid here in the US. We support programs all over the world, including in Latin America as well. Okay. Um, and for us, you know, we the sources of the funding are sometimes it's foundations, sometimes it's governments, but a really important part of it is people and just individual. So you accept uh, individual contributions. Individual contributions are really important because they, um, it's, it's about the financial contribution, mm -hmm. but it's also about the fact that people care about this issue. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a way of measuring how, if people care about this issue and whether we have a uh, base of supporters behind us, whether, you know, they, if they give $25 a month, um, it's that commitment, that individual commitment is really important to us. And, um, you know, we have small events, we like to um, also generate awareness. I would say in the last couple of years, the awareness levels in the US have really increased, partly do you think that is some of the issues that you talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because now we see that you know, this is a global issue. And I think yeah. you know, Americans uh, had this isolated sense of, okay, those problems are in another part of the world, they're not really affecting us. But I think also with the spread of certain diseases and diseases that have now come to our country that we have not seen in, mm -hmm. in decades, I think people are finally realizing, oh yeah, we live in a global society. And yes, uh, infections spread. Yeah, uh, and disasters, infections. you know, disasters, natural disasters. Drought. Um, drought, Famine. floods, you know, the whole thing. And so, um, and in, in a disaster, in an emergency, uh, water and sanitation is the first response. And it has to be part of the first response, particularly to avoid uh, outbreaks of disease like you're just mentioning. Yeah, so it's my friend, part of the public uh, health response. One of my friends is in the military and uh, she was stationed in different crises all over the world. She's been stationed in Kuwait and in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And um, she said her worst deployment ever was when she was deployed to New Orleans uh, in Louisiana in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. She said, you know, they just could not believe they were in the United States. Yeah. Um, they, the sewage was just free flowing through the streets and carnage. And yeah. they definitely had issues with no clean water. She said they had to sleep on top of school buildings. And she said, even though she was, you know, a captain in the army uh, and slept with her 
you know, arms with her, with her rifle, yes. she said she felt unsafe yeah. because, you know, of being in this situation where people yeah. are very, very desperate. Yeah. Very desperate situation. Yeah. I mean, sadly, I think that when things like that happen, it's kind of like, you know, it's tragic, but it's, it's also, it's like a great equalizer, right? It can happen to anybody. And it doesn't matter if you are wealthy or if you live in the nicer part of town or, you know, if there is a natural disaster and increasingly there are more of them, then uh, you are as affected as anybody else. And I think that message of just how interconnected we are. And, you know, I often say there, there is no there, you know, it's here. We like to think of here and there it's all here <laughs> or it's all there, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's very interconnected. And well, so she was saying... are, are, are false. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there is just, you know, more awareness about water issues and also about, you know, in the U S certainly, um, a feeling that this isn't, the job isn't done. You know, mm -hmm. we have to keep investing in these things. We have to keep protecting them. And, once you have a good quality of, let's say, water and sanitation, you have to still, it takes still thought and planning and investment to keep that going for the well, long term. Even for somebody who's listening to this and thinking, okay, well, why don't you just send porta potties? Yeah, I think people have to understand that you still need the infrastructure yeah. to then service those porta potties yeah. and drain yeah. those porta potties and that's a really good point because we talk a lot um and this is a little geeky but we talk a lot about a systems approach right so it's not about a technology or in your earlier example about the purell you know you could have that but there's a whole system around it there's a distribution how does the purell get into the clinic who supplies who Refills who's the it. account manager you know if you think about any service we have you know mm -hmm. the photocopier in the office or our phone or whatever it is there's a whole system that makes that thing work mm -hmm. and i think often we tend to focus on the thing and not as much as we should around all the things that make that work the system you need people you need trained people you need you know all of that stuff so um some of that is is harder to explain and is maybe not as immediately attractive when people start talking about systems but that's what makes things work and that's where uh, a lot of our effort and sort of we almost like map it out to say okay well in order for this to work uh what are all the other things that have to support it um and whether that's water or whether that's sanitation or you know if it's a health clinic that needs um that those services so yeah it's it's really about the the broader now you said that you have partnered with many other organizations on specific in-country programs that they happen to be doing have you partn partnered with any of the organizations that are making efforts to provide sanitary products to high school students for example yeah in some of our programs we actually support like local entrepreneurs that they make they, they make reusable pads mm -hmm. for girls. And um, it's a way, again, because if you, um, in some places, this isn't true everywhere, but in some places, uh, you could buy the supplies, but they're gonna run out. Right. And people may not have the money or the ability to go to the town to buy or, or the ability to again. dispose of so it properly. The reusable um, pads are something that actually become into a business. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big demand. Um, and so, yes, that kind of thing. Also, just to make sure even the, the way that bathrooms are designed in schools and in clinics and health centers, that they're designed in a way that you can have the privacy and just even basic things like a place to dispose of things. Mm -hmm. um, again, washing and uh, hand washing and all that. So, well, washing yeah. is an issue with the disposable, uh, with the reusable products. Uh, whether it's the reusable pads or also menstrual cups yes. are very cost effective in those situations and fairly convenient, but they still have to be washed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and changed. Yeah. You know, which yeah. is an issue. And of course, then girls have to use, learn how to use those. Yeah. Also, and they have to be instructed and, and distributed. So tell me about some of your products, uh, projects. Um, What's your so, favorite? Uh, very recently, my last uh, trip, I was in Colombia. I was in uh, 
very remote part of the country called La Guajira. Mm -hmm. It's mainly indigenous population. They, um, the YU, uh, are an indigenous population to that area. It's like a ar semi-arid place where water, you know, is, is really difficult because um, the weather patterns have been really disrupted. So they've just, they're just coming out of a long period of drought. Um, they rely very much on their animals, goats mainly, goat herding. So when there is no water, then the animals don't do so well, the people don't do so well. It's very interdependent. Um, culture. And so the work that we're doing there, um, you know, it's always inspiring to actually go and see the work. And I was able to go with some, to show the work to some of our board members, to some of our supporters, and um, to be able to see it again, sort of new from their eyes when they're seeing it is, is all, also quite um, rewarding. And again, you know, we visited schools, um, a high school, we visited community communities who were benefiting from uh, water that they didn't have before and sort of looking at what the impacts were. We were also um, assessing where we would go next. So looking at new communities where uh, we may be able to support. And, you know, we do that all with uh, contributions from people, from foundations, from, and every year we have to, I mean, the need is really large as you know so uh you know every year we have to sort of say okay well what can we take on this year and um in the past i, I mean i lived in ethiopia and i the work there uh i lived there for seven years so and was it the job that brought you there or were you there i was there already for a, another job and then i i, I found water aid while i was in ethiopia Got it. um and then i ran the the program there mm -hmm. um and it's it's it was really far ranging, you know, from uh, things that you might imagine like wells and springs and uh, rainwater harvesting and things like that. To I, one of my uh, one of my favorite projects was one where we were actually working with university students because mm -hmm. one problem we had identified is that there just weren't enough women in the water field water and you know at a household level the women were the ones who were most affected but as you went up the technical and career ladder uh it was all men making the decisions designing deciding planning all of that was being done by men so we really felt that if you didn't have more women in this area that the solutions wouldn't be um that we were missing no opportunities friendly. Yeah. I mean, we all feel that way every time we go to a ladies' room at a movie theater or at a theater or a sporting event. We're like, who are the architects who, in a stadium yes. that, that seats thousands and thousands of people, who had the bright idea that there should be four stalls? In yeah. the um, but speaking of college students, we have a lot of college students who listen, and we have a lot more parents of college students uh -huh. who for our podcast. So talk to me about internships that are available for college students with WaterAid. So we do, we have, we, we have a, intern, a summer intern program and a fall intern program. Um, we advertise on our website. Uh, and your website is? WaterAid.org okay. um, slash US, mm -hmm. or it will just come up as WaterAid.org. And we advertise, um, and we, we have had fantastic luck with our interns. We I mean, they're, fa they're really, um, I think as a staff, we're really inspired by the interns because they are so smart, so enthusiastic, so and are these they keep us on our toes. Are these internships available worldwide or just here? Um, most of them country? are either in our New York or DC office. Mm -hmm. um, opportunities to see the work firsthand, we do, um, we do that with some of our supporters. Um, we do that with some of our board members. It's it's harder because um, you know we're not equipped to run sort of a full volunteer program. There's a lot of administration and logistics that goes with that. Um, we do have occasionally there are um, volunteer or internship opportunities in the program countries, but our most uh, common way of doing internships is is here in the U.S. And about how many interns do you take each semester or the summer? Um, we don't have a, uh, we haven't set sort of a, a limit, but we normally have, you know, maybe eight. Oh, great. Um, at a time. And they work with different teams. It's actually a great internship opportunity. It's not, uh, we, we joke that, you know, we never ask people to make coffee here. <laughs> well, I was actually just saying to somebody, that, you know, with the advent of the Keurig machines and the pods, 
Like nobody has to have that demeaning, go make the coffee job because now everybody could just easily make their own cup of coffee. You know? Yeah. And the expectation is that you, that you would and that you should, you know, right. and if you have to have clean water to make coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Although I guess presumably you're boiling. I have to admit, I am not a coffee drinker. Um, I, I am a tea drinker. Uh, which also requires clean water. Anyway, so I know now you're going to get inundated with internship applications uh, in the next couple of weeks after after we air this. Um, but are your internships uh, certified for college credit with their host institutions? You know, I think that sometimes that is arranged, but we're not um, we're not uh, certified. I think that depends on the student and depends on the course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think also this would be a fabulous research topic for students in schools that have uh, sustainability courses or uh, where they have to do a senior thesis or yeah. a, a junior research paper. Yeah. Uh, this, this Some of our most amazing supporters are elementary school students. They love talking about poop. They think it's really funny. Mm -hmm. uh, One of my kids' favorite books when they were little was, it's called Everyone Poops. Yes, yes, how, how I know that book. Children? I have two small kids, so okay. I do know that How book. old are they? Um, and yeah, how so are, elementary How old are your school, children? People, you know, anybody can uh, find out more. And it's a, it's a relatable topic once you, once you don't think that it's over there. You know, when you start thinking about water and bathrooms and, you know, taking a shower and brushing your teeth, then it's a topic that kids really relate to. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of interest from school teachers and elementary schools, and they want to do projects, and then they do That's fundraising wonderful. for us. And it's a really nice, um, it's, it's, and we get letters from them, and you know, it's, it's very, very nice. Um, all kinds of people. We've had people do, you know, walk the Appalachian Trail for water aid. We've had people, um, college students that uh, are doing adventure things like there's um, a program called choose a challenge and so there there are students who are climbing mount kilimanjaro wow. for water aid and raising money and and having a great you know having a really meaningful experience but also raising money mm -hmm. so there's so many different ways to get involved and i think you know the best way to start is really on our website and to learn a little bit more and then um you know, we love to hear from people. We love to hear from our supporters or people who just want to know more, whether they uh, want to do a bit more research before deciding this is something that uh, they want to dedicate time or energy or money to. Um, so our website is a really good place to start. And, and, um, and there's we can't some, say you know, the videos address. and other things that you can watch as well. We can't say the address often enough. That's wateraid.org. Um, and I think as the call to action from today's uh, discussion, I would like everybody to go to the website to learn more about um, your organization. Of course, we will take questions that I will, if you don't mind, um, anyone who tweets me uh -huh. questions or sends them on our Facebook page, I would love to be able to forward them on to you so that you can answer them. And people can tweet me at Dr. Donica or go to my Facebook page at Dr. Donica, which is D-R-D-O-N-N-I-C-A. Um, the Facebook page does have a period, Twitter, no periods. Um, now we've figured out how to take away the periods. Uh, but just as a last question, um, what is the number one thing that's on your water aid wish list? If the good fairy came down right now, now and said you could have anything, what would it be? Well, you know, it would be that we would want everybody to have water sanitation and hygiene. That's, that's what we would ask from the good fairy. <laughs> Every and until the good everywhere. fairy visits, we were like plodding along and doing, you know, doing actually a lot of progress um, in the world. So the other thing, I guess, maybe to, to, to end by, we talk a lot about the problems and the challenges and how difficult it is. It's a very solvable problem. It's been solved in many countries. It's not something that we can't do with just the right sort of commitment and the right partnerships with government, business, people, you know, everyday people have to care about it. Right. And, and I think that's why we're doing this is yeah. I said, I want to be like John Oliver. I want to discuss everyday ordinary topics and remind people 
yeah. why they need to care about this. And yeah. they need to care about this because this is preventable. It is improvable. Yeah. It's a moral imperative. It's a social p- p- imperative. And it could affect us yeah. or our children. Yeah. Um, and that motivates us as people. It's unfortunate that we have to think that way in order to get motivated, but I'm kind of of the mindset that I don't really care what motivates you so long as you're motivated to do the right thing. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, it has been such a pleasure having you here. Uh, I want to thank you so much. I love the slogan, everyone, everywhere by 2030. Um, and again, I just you know can't say it enough. I want people to go to your website, wateraid.org slash US. I want all the college students to be applying for internships and <laughs> doing action adventures to raise money for you. And you know, I want to you want to hear that the individual co- uh, contributions are coming in, but also I know you rely heavily on corporate support and, of course, you know, grants. So that's really important. But thank you again so much for your time and for joining us in the ladies' room. Thank you. Take Thanks care. so much. Bye bye. Bye. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.